Back in the day in Bible college, we would gather together, a group of us guys, to watch the Ultimate Fighting Championships, <laughs> as one does when one is in Bible college. Um, these were the early ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and they were on VHS tapes rented from Blockbuster, right? The, the good old days. It was a w wild and crazy and cringy display of aggression and violence and domination. Uh, oh, oh, wait, it, it still is, <laughs> if, if you watch today. Uh, but that's where I learned about tapping out. Tap, tap. Tapping out is when the, the, the jujitsu guy has you wrapped up like your python prey. And you can't move. You can't do anything. And it's the last thing you do is just tap, tap. And the judge says, okay, he's free. He's free. But I, I knew about tapping out. Um, early on before I learned that term because uh, we just called it uncle or mercy. All right, tell me if you played these games. Games? Call them games? Uh, I'd, I would scream uncle or mercy. Uh, did you play that game as well? Yeah, uh, the, the, the pressure was on, right? When, when I would scream uncle when I couldn't take the weight, you know, my brother laying on me or the squeeze, the pressure, the pain. I was tapping out, right? How much pressure can I take? Well, not very much. <laughs> but when it comes to staying true, staying loyal to Jesus, keeping your allegiance to Jesus, how much pressure can you take? How much can, can you take before you tap out? When the pressure is on, will you give in? Have you wondered about that? Have you pondered? Have, have you had lots of experiences where you just kind of gave up, gave in? Um, the early church had many of these experiences. Uh, after the time of the apostles, there were, there were large groups of, of former Christians who just said, I, I can't take the pressure. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do what the emperor says, and I'm going to go um, sacrifice to them, and, and I'm going to go do these things, and, and they've, they stepped out of the faith. Uh, yeah, when the pressure's on, what's, what's it going to be like for you, for me? In the passage today, Peter and John are responding to the pressure of the authorities. They don't even seem to break a sweat, do they? they they're filled with the Spirit of God, and and there's something about them that's just strong and bold and beautiful. That's what I want to have. But I wonder, right? I wonder. They, they say to the authorities, we, we have to speak up. We, we have to talk about what we've seen and heard. Seemingly saying, does it, does it really seem safe to you to... Take the words of God and just keep them closed up, shut up in my mouth? Does that seem safe to you? This is God we're talking about. That doesn't seem safe to me. Well, you're the judges of, of Israel. Does that seem safe to you? As for us, we, we can't help but speak about what we've seen and heard. The authorities were trying to shut the door on gale force winds, trying to get it shut. And and the wind will not be kept out, right? The wind will not be kept out. You can try all you want to try to sh shut this door, but the, but the Spirit is coming. If Peter and John are connected to this force that can make a lame man walk, then they were up against forces they had no control over. Later in the story, they'll devise ways to try to stop the force, but it it actually serves to amplify the sound, not to quiet it. Yeah. So were the apostles shaken by this pressure, shaken to the core? Any sign of them tapping out, crying, Uncle, mercy? They sure didn't seem to be shaken, did they? But did you catch that the place where they gathered surely was shaken? They were all filled with the Spirit. They continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Oh, I want that for me. 
Uh, you say, oh, you're a preacher. You do that all the time. Well, yeah, and also I want that for me. I want that for you. I want you to have the, the, the boldness that comes with, with the Word of God filled with the Spirit pouring out of you. I want that for us together. Oh, God, I want that for us. I, I want that for our city. I want, I want to, to, to have for our city a family that's fully awake, fully alive, with allegiance to Jesus, that has a word to share with our city. Now, let's take, it that, take a look at that prayer and, and double-click on that prayer and, and dig a little deeper into it. And I think the main thing you'll notice is that the focus is all on God. There's, there's only one request in there. It's all about God. This is who you are. You're, you're the sovereign Lord, and we acknowledge your creation, your plan, your words, your hand, your Messiah, your spirit. We are your servants, right? And so I, I, wanna, I want us to just think through this today. This is, this is the main thing I want you to understand. It's that if we aren't taken in by God's glory, we're always going to tap out. If you're not taken in by God's glory, you're always going to tap out. We need to have a vision for who God is. And so he's a sovereign Lord. We acknowledge your creation. You know, as you look around you, uh, maybe, you maybe you've got a good spot where you're, um, where you're watching and, and, and listening. And, and you, could, you could look around and just say, yeah, that's his. Yeah, that's his. This creation, this, this location, wherever. Yep, that's his. That's his. Everything around the sea and the skies and the land, everything in them, it's all yours. That's how we, we gain that perspective on his glory. Everything I see is yours. You know, if you, if you get out into nature on a day that's maybe not 150 degrees, um, you know, you get out into nature and you start to see amazing, beautiful things. It's all stuff that God created. On our hike this last week, we went through and just saw these beautiful maple trees and beautiful cedars. And just think, man, God just is he's such a creative and beautiful artist. Use those opportunities to, to worship him. And maybe you already do that. But we need to be captivated by his creation. But it's all his. Absolutely all his. He says, uh, we acknowledge your plan. Did you catch that? This was your plan plan. The nations are raging, the Gentiles plotting in vain, the kings of the earth setting themselves up. This is all from Psalm 2, a really good read. Um, and, and everybody's gathered together against Yahweh and against his Messiah, right? The, in, this, in this case, the raging nations were given the perfect prey, perfect, uh, <laughs> because he had done no wrong. Perfect because they, he, they, they took the king himself, the righteous one, the holy and righteous one. And what do nations do with righteous people? Well, they judge them and they murder them. Jesus is our, our example in that. The, the wickedness, says Tom Wright, of the rulers is held in check and, and contained within the overall purpose of God, who makes even human wrath turn to his praise. Because this is, this is his plan. All these other people were gathered. Herod, the local king, Pontius Pilate, the governor um, appointed by Rome, along with the Romans and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Your hand, your plan. So somehow God in his sovereignty is able to weave your inclinations, their inclinations, their hard-heartedness, their plans to accomplish what, what he needs to have accomplished. In this case, it was to send uh, the son to come as himself, to bring humanity into himself and to be, um, be murdered by humanity itself. To, to show the powers of darkness up, show them for what they are, disarm them. This is what you do with the perfect one. Also to bear our sins and to forgive us and to be that sacrifice. There's so many things going on on the cross, but it was all part of God's plan. God can even make human wrath turn into his praise. 
So he says, this is your hand and your plan taking place. Now, now look on, on your, the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Your word. Your hand. Your word, not our cleverness or our techniques. Um, it's good to study up and it's good to be an approved workman of the word and to know how the word works and to know how to counter um, arguments with with gentleness and respect. And, and yes, absolutely, that's important to do that. But it's it's not our technique that's going to win. It's, it's God's words, not our words. And it's your hand that has done this. You're the one to stretch it out to heal. And you can then point to your power. It says you, you stretch out your hand to heal. So that's God doing it, not Peter and John. This God is stretching out his hand. His arm is not too short, as the Hebrew scriptures say. He can reach out, and he does stretch out his hand. And, and these healings are, again, they're signs and wonders, signs that point to his power. So your hand stretched out to heal, pointing to your power. This is all about him, all about his creation, his power, his plan, his purposes, his hand, his word. You stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Your holy servant, Jesus. Jesus is the one we look to because he is holy and righteous. He is, he is set apart for God's purposes. He has um, lived the, the morally perfect life, but also he's shown us the way to live the new human life, the new humanity. He's righteous. He does what is right before God and before others. Um, it, it's all about him. And then the last little bit we see is, is his spirit. So, so this is your Messiah, your spirit. Um, they're, they're having one spiritual life together. One spirit, one life together. And what do they ask for? There's, there's the one request. What do they ask for? Oh, just, just grant us boldness. That's what we want. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your words with all boldness. So I want to take those two things apart. Boldness to speak your words. Let's talk about boldness right now. Uh, we see it clearly in there. They stand up to power. They say, you be, you be the judge. Is it safe to shut up God's words in our hearts? I think we've got we've to speak up. Per perhaps you, you've heard that um, in Iran, we have the fastest growing church in the world right now. Under Islamic leadership, rulership, under the Ayatollah, and during COVID. In, in, in some areas there and in, in other places around the Middle East, they're actually putting up signs. Have you seen Jesus in your dreams? If so, call this number and we'd like to introduce you to him. Because God has been showing up and, and showing his, his presence and his power and pointing people to him. It's happening all over the world, but Iran is one of those places. And I want you to think, is Iran going to be a better nation because of the Christian presence there? Because they are now holy and righteous servants who are doing God's bidding. Yeah, they'll, they'll be the best neighbors and citizens, but they won't bow the knee to power, will they? No, they won't tap out because they've tapped in to God's glory. Peter and you and I and John and the Iranians and Chinese Christians have a, have a loyalty to the state that is subversive. So let's call it a subversive loyalty to the state. You'll be the best citizens, absolutely, but you're not going to go the whole distance. There will be a divergence point from our loyalty, right? We, we, will, we will worship our God and serve the nation, but we will not worship our nation as God. We'll not worship our culture as God. There's going to be that point of divergence from your loyalty. There's a boldness there. It's a subversive loyalty that followers of Yahweh have had throughout the story of the Bible, throughout Throughout history, uh, it's bold 
but it's not brash. It's strength under fire. That's the kind of boldness we're talking about. The kind of boldness that leads uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Perhaps you know this, Daniel chapter 3. It, it leads them to stand up in the face of certain destruction, it seems, to the king who rules the entire region that they serve. They're, they're serving. They're, they're, royal, they're part of the, the royal rule in Babylon, not too far from Iran. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up a, an image, a golden image, big golden image and it was time to bow down and worship you know when the when the songs play when the musicians go everybody needs to bow down and worship this image probably an image of of nebuchadnezzar himself as the king and you know shadrach meshach abednego their their friend daniel he's not they're not going to go that far they no no we'll serve we'll rule we'll help we'll do all these things but we're not going to bow down to 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 you which symbolizes the nation state uh, we're not going to do that. And some of us have, have had to d do our own test. Are we bowing down to an ideal of a nation, or are we bowing down to God Almighty himself? So when everybody fell down, everybody did, except for some. <laughs> and they got called out. And so the people came and accused these Jewish people who were living in Babylon and says, King, live forever. Uh, you know, everybody's supposed to fall down and worship the image. But um, And whoever doesn't fall down and worship the image is going to be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. That's a lot of fire. Uh, there are certain Jews whom you have pointed over your affairs of the province. You know, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O King, pay no attention to you. Was well, that really true? <laughs> they actually serve him very well. But they don't serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Ooh. So Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. And so they brought them here before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said, uh, answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, okay, if you're ready now, we're going to play the music and you need to fall down and worship the image that I've made. Sounds good. But if you don't worship, you're going to be tossed immediately into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Whew. Who's that going to be, right? Nobody. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and, and he'll deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. <laughs> That's pretty bold. Nebuchadnezzar is filled with fury. Expression of, of his face changed, and he, was, and, and he was just like, I'm done with you. And so he's like, heat the furnace up seven times hotter, he binds them up and they go to throw them in there. And, and you have to read the rest of the story that ensues. But uh, you know, even the guys throwing them into the fire get overcome and, and die. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't. In fact, someone comes to meet him in the fire. There was another in the fire, right? We, we believe that that was the Son of God, Jesus, come to be with with him, with them, in the midst of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar, even if, even if we do burn up and die, we're still not going to serve you, even if God doesn't do it. But um, we're, we don't have to answer you in this matter. You be the judge. Is it safe for you? you know, so so this, this subversive loyalty that has been present among followers of Yahweh is, is still happening today in Iran, happened to hear in this this story here as well in Acts uh, chapter 4. Uh, perhaps you know this, that when the persecuted church around the world connects with maybe the Western church or non-persecuted church, um, they ask for prayer, right? They, we need prayer. And every time you ask them, what do you need for prayer? What do you want? They don't ask for more comfortable circumstances or even really release from prison. Perhaps you know this. 
the main prayer of the persecuted church is boldness in the face of opposition. Just give us boldness. May God's spirit embolden us. Could we have a vision of God that's so glorious that, that we tap into so that we don't tap out in these other um, pressure systems that we're in? So like Peter and John and the other disciples, their prayer isn't, God, please cause our enemies to die a horrible death. Uh, it's not, stop their madness and rage. It's not, you got to let this persecution stop. Or, God, would you just convert the authorities so we can continue on your work without having any threats? No, they say, Lord, look on their threats and let us go on speaking boldly. And you continue to work powerfully. Do your thing. In this book that I've um, been processing, reading, it's, it's called Live Not By Lies. Rob Dreyer um, has a statement. I wonder if, if you think he overstates the case or not. He says, relatively few contemporary Christians are prepared to suffer for their faith. Because the therapeutic society that has formed them, now therapeutic meaning like, uh, it's all, we all just want to be, be good and comfortable and happy and avoid all these bad things. The therapeutic society that's formed them denies the purpose of suffering. Denies the formative work of suffering in the first place. And the idea of bearing pain for the sake of truth seems ridiculous. I'll oh, tap out. Tap out. Tap out. It's too tough. Tap out. Do you think that's true? That relatively few... Contemporary Christians are prepared to suffer for their allegiance to Jesus. You know, I, I have a, a good friend, doesn't follow Jesus, um, and sat with him uh, around a campfire on, on Father's Day. And I was starting to feel the pressure because, um, you know, I'm hanging out with him. He doesn't know and love Jesus. And he's starting to put some questions to me. And, and I was... I was like, okay, Jesus, what are, you, what are you going to do here? And the basic idea, the basic question was, if you could go back in time um, and you could view Jesus and the disciples and you found out that the disciples weren't who they said they were, Jesus wasn't who he said he was, these things didn't happen, would you come back here and still preach to Issaquah Christian Church like it's all you know, like it's all true because it, there's so much value in just the story. There's so much value in that. And it, it took about 20 minutes, as one should, um, to explain why. Uh, <laughs> no, of course I wouldn't. Uh, no, of course I wouldn't pr to pr promulgate a lie and begin to, to share with them, you know, the essentials of, of the stories, the signs and wonders, the, the what point to Jesus as Messiah. And I was able to preach the gospel um, and, but the, the, all the while, you know, what I was doing while he's asking the questions, I'm like, Jesus, give me wisdom, give me boldness, give me insight, help me understand that. And that's what we all need to be asking for. Fill me with your spirit, give me boldness. And it's not just boldness, um, for boldness sake, but it's boldness to speak your words, your words. Now the authorities knew that these men were, uh, uneducated, right? They're, they're not superior men in the in the city you know they're not they're not the aristocrats but they realize they have been with jesus wouldn't that be amazing as a first impression well you know I, what do you know about andrew well um at first he didn't he didn't seem like much but then i got the impression that he'd obviously spent some serious time with jesus he's like a he, he's like a, a clone of jesus it's kind of amazing Peter and John got their words from Jesus. So that when they spoke, they were speaking his words. They had spent the time with him. And you can too. You can too. They learned his tone, his method, his way of life. And the Spirit gave them the recall. Oh, that's what he's talking about. Okay, putting the pieces together, bringing scripture together. So as a matter of soul training, are you soaking in scripture? So that, like a sponge, you soaked it in so the Spirit can wring you out when the pressure is on. So that you have a word for our city. 
not some good soul training. Invest the time to know Jesus' words and his method and his way of life so that when the pressure is on, the truth rings out or is wrung out of you. And even when you get the chance to speak, it's not your words or my words, but it's his words by his power. That's what we want. And and, and a, a caution here, we, we don't borrow Jesus to speak our words. Jesus is not for sale to advertise our ideas. Perhaps you know that, and you're thinking you're pointing the finger already. (laughs) He's not available to promote our agenda. Let me say it simply. Jesus is not our mascot. He's, He's not one for us to just pin to our flag and say, Jesus says. No, we, we have to absorb his word, his way, and his power. So, so we, you don't kill babies or even kill abortion doctors in Jesus' name. You, you don't do it. He, he will not allow his name to be used for that. You don't encourage and applaud immorality in Jesus' name. He doesn't, he doesn't allow his name to be used for that. You'll stand under judgment if you do that. You don't storm a capital and try to overturn an election in Jesus' name. He doesn't do that. That's not the way of Jesus. You don't support violence or vile behavior in Jesus' name. He's not a mascot. We need to absorb his words and be filled with the Spirit and speak his words with power. We don't borrow Jesus to speak our words. But if he is speaking, woo, if these are his words and his power, no authorities will shut it down. They can't. They can rage all they want. They cannot shut it down. Right? Like closing the door on the, on the, on the gale force wind. You're not going to be able to do it. But if you aren't taken in by God's glory, you'll always tap out. If you're not taken in by his glory, his power, his story, you will, will always tap out. I encourage you to soak in the scripture. Soak in the way of Jesus. Be filled with the spirit. Be filled with boldness. Be filled with the story. Be filled with his glory so that you can stay strong in the face of the pressure.